behind here, we're coming up on the temple, which might look a little peculiar to visitors right now as uh, this one column is exposed where the rest of them are not. We have stripped the plaster and stucco off this column to inspect the integrity of the bricks underneath to see if there's any deterioration or signs that they need repair or they're crumbling. So as you can see up there, there's a little bit of the plaster still left, but we've stripped it away from the rest and it really sh allows us to see the variation and the different colors and the textures of the bricks underneath. So this column is made up of a special type of brick called compass bricks. They are called that for their shape. They are pie shaped. And these bricks are, were made on site. They are handmade, which is evident by the different shades of brick colors we see here. Just the soil coming from different areas or it being burnt differently in the kiln. And then they would have been stacked up to make this beautiful column right here. You obviously know a lot about this topic, and I'm just curious if people ask you how you became interested in historic preservation. Yeah, so I do get that question a lot. It's a very niche field. I think it stems back to my childhood. So I grew up in this tobacco farm in Southern Virginia, and it had been my family for 100 years. My grandfather was born on that farm. He grew up there. So we always had all these cool little old buildings uh, somewhere on the farm. And I remember when I was little, I would go and like peep in the windows and like look at the way things were built and explore all the rooms. And that really got me interested in how buildings are built and like really looking at buildings in a different way. And it was, I always thought it was so sad growing up seeing these buildings kind of decay and fall down and I really got interested in a way to work towards protecting them and preserving them. Mm -hmm. So that kind of all led me to think about college and I went to college to major in historic preservation mm -hmm. and through those classes I kind of learned about how buildings are built and how they can be preserved in these many different ways and I really got into the nitty-gritty of preservation. I love being in buildings and figuring out how they were made, what they were made with, and all those different things. It's kind of like a little puzzle that you got to piece together sometimes to figure out how a building is made. And I realize it's just so incredible that a hundred years ago people could just go out in the woods and forest wood and build something out of it. That just blows my mind sometimes. So really understanding how they did that and how they were able to build structures that we can still see on our landscape a hundred years later is really interesting and it really uh, made me want to preserve them even more. Mm. And then coming out of college, I really love the idea of cultural landscapes and how cultural landscapes shape the people. And a lot of that has to do with the historic structures on a landscape is we are all connected to our history and these buildings speak to that history. And being able to preserve them is something that I think is so important because our heritage is connected to that. And if we tell the stories of the people who lived in these buildings, we also tell the stories of the greater community. So every building is important to the community. It's in, even if it's just one little old building. And sometimes it's so easy to tear down a building because it's abandoned or it's dilapidated, but it's so important to our culture, cultural heritage and to our understanding of who we are and our history and how that shapes us to preserve these places. So that's something that I really work towards is uh, preserving cultural landscapes. You obviously sound very passionate about this. I'm curious if people ever ask you about what your favorite aspect of preservation here at Montpelier is. Yes, yeah, so uh, my favorite aspect of preservation here is the variety of architectural styles we have on this property. We have almost around 200 buildings on property and it's crazy because we it's one of the only places I know where you can have this magnificent 18th century mansion, but also have all these great 20th century agricultural structures and tenant housing. And it's so great to see the vernacular with the more high style federal architecture and see that contrast on the same property and get to explore that every single day. Mm -hmm. I, a lot of times when I have downtime or I just need a break from my typical work, I'll go and explore the, the barns around property. And it's great because sometimes I find things that relate to my project in these barns because we use a lot of that for storage for the DuPont material that was removed from the house during the restoration. I also love all the examples of the approaches to historic preservation that we can find here on property and actually I can take you around and show you a few. The first one is just right over here. <laughs> So here we are at the uh, dog kennel slash bathrooms. So this is an example of adaptive reuse. These were the dog kennels that the DuPonts built mm -hmm. back in the uh, early 20th century and they used it to house some of their dogs. Marion DuPont Scott was really into mm -hmm. dog breeding, especially Jack Russells, Dalmatians. Uh, but then later on during the restoration, we decided that we needed bathrooms, which we couldn't really have inside the house. Mm -hmm. So it was decided to convert this wonderful old building into a nice little restroom area for visitors. And adaptive reuse is a great way to give an old structure 
new purpose through updating it and uh, making it useful in a different way that bring, still keeps its historical integrity. It still looks like a dog kennel, but it now has a different use. So here we are outside house number 10. This is one of the houses in our constitutional village, which is several houses that were used by the DuPonts as tenant housing. So this is an example of rehabilitation because we have updated some of the things inside the house with like modern electricity, modern heat, mm. modern things like that, but we, it's still used for the same purpose. And the exterior still looks about the same. We haven't really changed it to anything. We're not taking it back in time. We're just remodeling it to fit um, more current day uh, technologies. But it's still used to house our guests who come here for any types of programs. So we are in the DuPont Bowling Alley, and this is a great example of preservation because we are merely maintaining the current condition of this building. We're not updating it, we're not changing it. So you can see we still have the bowling lane, the pins, the return. So this building was built sometime between 1901 and 1908, and then after the restoration, uh, we continue to maintain it as a bowling alley. Uh, we do any maintenance that needs to be done. So for example, a few years ago, a tree fell on the back end of the bowling alley, and we did do repairs to repair that, um, but otherwise we are maintaining its current condition and making sure it doesn't deteriorate or have any major changes. So Tessa, so far you've talked about adaptive reuse, rehabilitation, and preservation. So tell me, what's next? Well, we are now in the South Yard, which is a great example of reconstruction. All these buildings are where the enslaved community for Madison would have worked and spent most of their time. And they had all been pretty much demolished before the DuPonts bought it. So we know what these buildings look like through archaeology. So archaeology actually found the foundations, the chimney, hearths for a lot of these buildings. And then looking at other contemporary examples, we were able to construct these buildings to look like what they would have been. And that's what all, reconstruction is all about is reconstructing something that's gone. Mm -hmm. Especially with this building, this is the planter's cottage, we know that this was the starter home for Madison and his parents because of the plaster band that was found on the chimney top uh, through archaeology and that actually matched the plaster bands on the main house chimneys. Mm -hmm. So we know at some point his parents and him were, would have been living here probably while the main house was being built. After they moved out this uh, building became a kitchen and was used by the enslaved people to make meals for especially Madison's mother Nellie while she lived on this side of the house. So we have one last approach to preservation to talk about and that is restoration. Mm -hmm. And the best example for that is of course the main house. But if we go inside we can talk to Jennifer and Leanna and they could probably tell us a little bit about a small detail of the restoration that made a huge difference. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Leanna. Hey. Oh, hi. How are you all? Good. How are you today? Doing well. So we hear that you all are on a restoration and preservation tour of the property, and so we're glad you could join us here in the restoration room. Uh, so we love this room, we call it the restoration room because it really peeled back the layers on the restoration process and also on building processes of the time period. And so one hidden treasure, so just beyond the bones of the building, we have this really wonderful wall painting, uh, this really beautiful little decorative uh, element here. Really the only you know piece of remaining uh, wall painting, it's the last bit of evidence, so that's why we kept it uncovered so people could sort of see this really unique uh, evidence here in the restoration room. This is obviously a really unique space mm -hmm. and I think it really speaks to kind of the importance of the preservation process mm -hmm. that went into this historic home. Um, and since you mentioned the wall painting, Tessa has been taking me around the property and showing mm -hmm. me different examples of the preservation process at mm -hmm. these different sites across this, the whole property. Um, and so uh, we're really interested in kind of delving into the history and the restoration of the main house, the main Madison house. Uh, and so she mentioned that you could tell us a little bit about the importance of the wallpaper in the preservation process. Absolutely. So we love, love, love our wallpaper. <laughs> Most of the first floor rooms uh, have wallpaper. The evidence that was found, both physical evidence in the case of the drawing room and then documentary evidence that, you know, so 
suggested other types of wallpaper patterns really clued us into the fact that a lot of these rooms of this early you know, 19th century time period were all about the wallpaper. If we go downstairs and go to Mr. Madison's room, I think that's a great space where we can really talk a little bit more about what this reproduction wallpaper process was and, and get to see it uh, in the actual room itself. Well, welcome down here to Mr. Madison's room. Uh, this room is right now interpreted to be Madison's later time in life. So uh, the, towards the end of his life when he's more bedridden, so that explains the giant bed behind us. Um, and this room initially would have been a second parlor space, which is why it has wallpaper. So sometimes bedrooms, like some of the upstairs rooms, sometimes they have wallpaper, sometimes they don't. But this room has wallpaper because it, it was initially in, you know, configured to be a secondary parlor space. Uh, so um, I think we should um, step up and we can get a closer look at the wallpaper and talk a little bit about how we source our reproduction wallpaper and the process that goes into making that wallpaper. So now that we can take an up close look, um, we can really get a feel for what this wallpaper process was like. Uh, so this particular wallpaper was chosen based on documentary evidence. Um, we knew there was wallpaper in this space, but there wasn't really any physical evidence. So this is what we call our curatorial best guess. This is called green net, um, and it's sort of this net slash trellis design. It was just a really popular motif. So it's period appropriate. It was European and design but was reproduced here in the States. Uh, this is actually based on an existing wallpaper pattern that was found uh, in the New England area still surviving so it's based on an actual period pattern. And so we have this re wallpaper reproduced for us. There's this wonderful company called Adelphi Paper Hangings and they specialize in doing this hand blocked wallpaper. And so what I really love to think about is all of these different colors and layers are each a separate block application. So they created these big carved uh, wooden blocks. And so each iteration is a different like stamping essentially. So you have to put your base layer. So here the base layer is this sort of gray marbleized look. So that would be your first stamp layer. And then you get into all the different nettings. But when you get up and close, you can see there's three different colors in this netting. So that means three different applications. So it's a very involved uh, process to reproduce this hand blocked wallpaper. And so it makes it really special is that even though it's a modern reproduction, it was made with these historic practices in mind. So it really feels authentic to the space uh, and to the time period. Thank you guys for sharing all this wonderful information with us today. It's really been fascinating. So we really appreciate it. But we are about to wrap up our tour, so we are going to head out. But again, thank you guys for sharing with us. Yeah, absolutely. We love being able to share this information with our visitors and with our esteemed colleagues. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your tour. Bye. Bye. <laughs> So Tessa, we've learned a little bit about everything that went into the restoration of Montpelier. Now when folks hear about how much went into the house, do they ever ask how much of it is original? Yes, they do. And it really is amazing how much the house changed after the Madison occupation. But the restoration team did an equally amazing job at finding the Madison house within the DuPont house. Mm. So the DuPonts totally transformed the Montpelier house from what we see today. They expanded it from 22 rooms to 55 rooms. They added huge wings on the back. They also changed the landscape a lot. They added the track, they added a pool, they added the bowling alley. So all these different things were happening on property. And this led when Marion DuPont Scott decided to will the property to the National Trust. This led the the trust to decide maybe a restoration would be possible because you couldn't find Madison in the house anymore. It didn't look anything like the original house and it was just hard to interpret it to visitors. And this was pretty controversial at the time. This was going to be the first major restoration of this type to happen at a presidential site. And you were going to have to remove over 50 years of history. And according to preservation theory, the DuPont house was significant in its own right because it was older than 50 years. So it had its own historical significance besides being the house that Madison lived in. So it was to this point of how do you remove a building that is also significant in some ways. And really it came down to the fact that 
the Montpelier house was still there. After a two-year investigation period where they went in and opened up whole units into the wall and really peeled back all these layers, they found that almost 80% of the house was original, which was crazy to think about because the DuPonts really just encapsulated the Madison house inside of it. They were frugal, they saved a lot of things, reused things, so it was all there. The restoration team just had to find it. And this really led to the whole restoration process that took eight years, $24 million. And we have the house that Madison lived in. It's restored and it looks pretty much just what Madison would have lived in. Thank you for taking me around the property today, Tessa. It was fascinating learning about these different types of preservation, these different processes, which really allow us to delve deeper into place. So for example, we have the restoration of the Madison House and that history, but we also have the reconstruction of the South Yard, for example, where domestic enslaved people lived. Their stories help tell this broader, fuller picture of Montpelier as this kind of birthplace of constitution and this paradoxical place of liberty and freedom, um, all while being a site of enslavement. So uh, it was really kind of this um, interesting process of learning about how your work and what you do as the kind of expert preservationist here on site enhances the stories we tell at Montpelier. Um, so I'm just curious if there are any parting thoughts you have before we conclude for today. Yeah, so speaking about different histories, you know, this is the Madison House, but it is a version of the Madison House that Madison himself never really lived in. I say that if he were to come up this path right now, he would recognize this house, but as he started to walk through it, he would notice some things that aren't exactly his. Um, and that's because this house has its own timeline, its own history, it has its own purpose. And its purpose is to be a historic house museum. So it is important to be critical when you look at historic buildings and to really look into the layers that they have and not to look over any layer or to exclude any of them because you think they're not important. You can always learn a little something by looking into the details of a historic house. Well, thank you again, Tessa. And thank you for spending a moment of your time with us.